You know, our Heavenly Father is so good to us that He gives us choices. And He gives us a road map. And um, then it's all up to you. Your life is your business. Your choice. Which road you take. You see, there's always two roads. The word journey itself is an interesting word. The etymology of it is way or path. You know, it doesn't, you know, you would think, well, the word journey uh, in uh, Hebrew or in Greek would mean to saddle up and ride or we're going to make a big trip. No, it just means the road you're going to walk on. That's the etymology. And it kind of amuses me because things don't change. I know none of you have ever been told to hit the road, take a trip, get lost, or anything of that nature. But that's, you know, it's strange, but the word journey in the Hebrew and the Greek, it both means the same thing. It's a path. And um, I suppose most people are followers, aren't they? We, you know, we're, and isn't that smart? Because if there's a nice path, smooth path, you're not going to get off out here in the boonies, are you? It's a lot easier going on the path. And I thought of a, a way that um, we could come into this with our Father's advice from the Old Testament. Open your Bibles to the book of Job. You know, Job is a book you've got to be real careful of. If Job is talking, that's pretty good. But he had some ratchet jaws for buddies. And that's not, my, that's not my word, that's God's word. God finally would tell Job after 38 chapters, he said, what are you listening to these people that have no knowledge? You know, and a lot of preachers preach sermons on the book of Job. <laughs> and God's already called them ratchet jaws. They sure like to talk. But it's what your father says that's important. Always remember that, even in his word. Because he has little lessons to check up on you to see if you're asleep, awake, or somewhere in between. But this is Father's advice. Job is speaking. And Job had it together pretty good. He was a very righteous man. Chapter 12 in the great book of Job. Chapter 12. Let's pick it up with verse 20. And the topic is journey. Verse 20 reads, uh, can, this is our Father's doings, and basically what it's saying is God's in control. He removed away the speech of the trusty. In other words, um, he, he can make a person dumb if he wants to, and taketh away the understanding of the aged. He can do that. He poureth contempt upon princes and weakeneth the strength of the mighty. If they got it coming, God corrects those he loves. Verse 22, he discovereth deep things out of darkness and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. He, he brings forth hidden mysteries to those that he chooses to, all right? That, that he chooses to, no, that choose to follow the right path. He increaseth the nations and destroyeth them. Do you want to know who's in control? Do you worry about nations? You don't have to. God takes care of things. He enlargeth the nations and straightens them again. He'll, um, he will uh, pull them back. 24. He taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth. And you know, there's another prophecy that states in the end times your leaders will have children's minds or act like a bunch of little children. Uh, chief of the earth and uh, people of the earth and causeth them to wander in a wilderness where there is no way where there is no path. I don't know, you want to make sure your life never gets like that. Where you're in, you know, if you've ever been out in a tall wilderness where you can't see hardly the sun and there's no trail, people get lost like that if they're not pretty savvy to nature. You can get turned around real easy and that's what God wants you to pick up on this from. When your life gets into such a overcropping of wilderness and there's no path that you know to follow. If you're not careful, you can lose it all. Darak, darak is the Hebrew word for way or path or journey. Your journey is not going very far if you allow yourself to get into that condition. Verse 25, they grope in the dark, in the dark without light. 
and he maketh them to stagger like a drunken man. And, you know, um, biblical illiteracy, not being familiar with our Father's Word because he's given, he's given you the path, He's given you the way. His instructions are there. That, you know, He created these flesh bodies and He sent this Word along with it. It's the how-to book. He even brought one out, especially the book of Ecclesiastes, for you to be happy, the man that walks under the sun, which is a Hebraism that means in the flesh. How to be happy in these flesh bodies. If you never covered the book of Ecclesiastes with understanding, you'd be hard-pressed to know the path to find that happiness at all times. So his word is so, his path, his way, is so very important that you choose it. Now the beauty of this whole thing of our Father in that he loves you is that that word is also full of ways for you to get back on the correct path. In other words, to straighten your life out, uh, spiritually and morally speaking. Your, your moral life must take a path also, and it's real easy to straighten out, and he gives total forgiveness for any time we get off of that path. Isn't that wonderful? That's great, because all of us do at times. Get off that path, and you're like out in that wilderness trying to see daylight, trying to figure out where you are, It'd be so dark under tall trees you can't even find the North Star sometimes. So you have to learn all the tricks of life to know how to get back on that trail. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Straight means narrow, okay? For wide is the gate and broad is the way. There you have that old word again, hados in the Greek that um, leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. You don't want to go in at the wide gate. The narrow gate is sufficient. Now, let me tell you something. Many people try to picture this, and they use the analogy of a life, perhaps too much. Well, wide is that gate, and they're all just fun. No, I've seen a lot of wide roads that were empty. And I've seen a lot of narrow gates that people are just filing through in order and, hey, filling the place up. So, uh, and naturally, the, you have two ways to choose from, two paths. The big wide gate out into the world or the straight gate. And naturally, you, I would be in error if I didn't teach you that Christ is looking for disciples here. This is written for the disciple. That means um, the word disciple comes from our, Eng our English word discipline comes from the word disciple. One that wishes to discipline themselves in the word of God. To know and understand what our father would have us know. And naturally, um, that narrow gate is to Christ. Why? Well, there is no other way, especially not for the Christian. All right? There is no other way. Is it narrow? Well, that's your only choice, okay, is to go in at the gate into the sheep cot, which he holds. You wouldn't want any of the rest of it anyway, would you? It's a, it's a, there's no path out there. And even if you get on one, it's a path of streets that cross with no numbers and life that you want no part of because it's, it's a path to destruction. So who makes your mind up as to which path you take? You do, okay? I want people to take responsibility for their own actions. This is a real world and you must face reality. And you must know that he loves you and any time you're so confused you need help, what do you do? You ask him. Boy, he loves it when you talk to him. When you ask him, I, I need a little help right along about here. Okay? And uh, sometimes he'll make a special detour for you right back onto that path. And you're back in the right way, back in the narrow gate. Now, 
What does all that mean? Words are so easy. But what is he really saying compared to truth, knowledge, and wisdom? Well, let's check it out. He never gives us half a thought without uh, continuing it. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. That means they look like uh, your church. They look like Christians. They might even claim to represent Christ. But inwardly they are raving wolves. And Jesus in both books, Matthew 24, Mark 13, says, Beware, do not let men deceive you, for many will come in my name claiming to be to belong to Christ, okay, or teachers of Christ's word. So you want to watch them. And then, you know, the, the thing that I amazes me is how God has a way of simplifying things. Amen. That's kind of a scary thought in a way. Amen. That um, you could run across somebody and say, I'll be a Christian. Well, are they or aren't they? Verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? And of course, the answer to that is no, absolutely not. Well, what, what did he mean by that? Well, if you want to learn God's word, do you read a Harry Potter book? I mean, is it going to give you God's word? Or do you read some quarterly that man translated? Do you know the man and do you know how honest he is? Why not just, if you want God's Word, if you're wise, where are you going to go? To God's Word, of course. From man, you're going to get a bunch of garbage in a lot of cases. Amen. You never listen to this man or any other man without checking him out in the Word of God. That is your governor. That's what tells you right from wrong. Now, so, you know, it's pretty easy to tell a fig from a thorn bush. You know, it doesn't take a very intelligent person to figure that out. So that's what God's way of saying, I'm not going to make this difficult for you. Verse 17, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. And it always will. And, of course, what was Christ? He's the tree of life. What was Satan? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's what they are. You, you mess around where Satan has influence and he'll put out about 95% good fruit and boy, that 5% he throws in there at the end, twists the word of God till it's traditions of man and no good. You know, when Christ was tempted in the wilderness, do you know Satan quoted scripture Satan knows more scripture than most Christians. I mean, he quoted Deuteronomy. He quoted Leviticus. I mean, just popped it right out there. There was just one problem. Quoted the Psalms. Just one problem. Each time he twisted one, the very end of it about 90 or 45 degrees. Enough to get you off the path that you'd be lost if you followed him. But he was claiming to be a servant of God, using God's, using God's word to tempt with. See? So it's important that you be familiar and have a working knowledge of this set of instructions that tells you how to be successful in these flesh bodies. That's what he sent it for, to keep you on course, on path. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. You know, you take a person, I mean, th this is the trunk, and these are the limbs, okay? That's what he wants you to see in this. You take a person that is honest, that loves the Father, you couldn't hire them to do something crooked that would really hurt somebody. They would say, no, thank you. They're not going to produce bad fruit. Now, nobody's perfect, all right? I mean, I imagine all of you, uh, if you're an apple tree, have a sour apple every once in a while. 
I don't know, maybe, maybe I shouldn't judge you, okay? That would be judging, wouldn't it? I mean, we all, met, we all have problems. That's what I'm saying. Don't, don't ever think that just because you have problems, you're different. You're not. But this is what you come back to, to get to the truth. And it's, it's just that simple to get back on path. 19, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That happens at the lake of fire at the very end, okay? 20, wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. If, something, if someone claims to be a teacher of God's word, okay, and they come up to you and say, God says, and that sounds impressive, doesn't it? What you want to pay attention to is what he's quoting about God or from God's Word. Okay. Is it really from God? I don't know how familiar are you with God's Word. Um, verse 21. Now everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Well, how, how do I know his will? You By staying on the path. By knowing the word. That's, he, he lets you know his will. The question is, have you covered it? Okay. Now, well, how, would, how severe that would be to keep someone out of heaven? Well, hey, if you're biblically illiterate, you're probably not aware of the fact that the sixth seal and at the sixth trump and at the sixth vial, that's 666, Satan appears on earth as the Antichrist, meaning in the Greek simply instead of Jesus, claiming to be Jesus. You know, if somebody hadn't studied the word enough that it's made simple enough a child can understand it, in many places, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, a fourth grader can tell you who's coming first and what's going to happen. But if you get your donkey loaded up with men's traditions and sayings until you can't read the word and stick with the subject, you're in trouble, friend, bad trouble. Because the false one appears before the true one does. And do you know something? The true is going to tell you just like he did there to go fly a kite. Or that means to take a hike. You're on the wrong road. Go somewhere else. Well, that seems so unfair. Oh, that's why Christ said, Woe to those that are with child when I return and that give suck. That's a figure of speech that means you're supposed to remain. Mark 13 and Matthew 24, where this is the subject is the return of the true Christ, but the first appearance of the fake. Christ expects to take a virgin bride, spiritually speaking, and if he comes back to take a virgin bride after he's been gone 2,000 years and she's nursing, nursing means doing the work of Satan, all right? If she's supposed to be a virgin and she's got a suckling child, what does that mean? That means she was not true to the living God, all right? She fell off to the deception, to the lie. And naturally, would you blame Christ then for saying, hey, you're not coming in here. You're a Satan worshiper. Well, I didn't mean to, Lord. You're a Satan worshiper. And of course, we have the millennium as an equalizer. Isn't that wonderful? But God sent the Word. The Word is the tree, the tree of life. It will tell you what is right and what is wrong. And, you know, not too many people want to take a virgin bride that's carrying a young child by your arch rival and enemy. That, you know, Christ has a way of using analogies that you can relate to. And if, um, if oh well, that's, I think that's clear enough. I won't touch that anymore. But, but um, test the fruit of the tree. And where do you test it? Not from a book somewhere, but from God's book, from God's Word. It's the truth. And you know something? If you expect His blessings, then you better know His book. 
Now, I'm not saying you have to be a genius and have to memorize it and all that. You at least have to know his word before you can do it, right? Isn't that common sense? In other words, if you go down here to apply for, well, I'm going to take this young man that just graduated from a military school. What did he learn there? He learned how to snap too. He learned how to obey orders. He learned how to take care of business. Now, how would you like to take some young man? <laughs> I saved myself. <laughs> that refused any form of discipline or that that is right. Which do you want to protect or signify or represent your country and you? I think that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Well, Father feels the same way. And he likes for his children to be in his plan, be trained, in other words, training and discipline. That's what discipline is about, is disciplining yourself. I'm, I'm not telling you to become some religious fanatic. I'm telling you to use common sense and know where blessings come from so you can receive them. Okay? So, naturally, God's going to say, hey, I don't, I don't want you. I don't know you. And let's pick it back up again. In verse 22, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. What is his answer? 23, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You know, you either know what you're doing or you don't. If you've taken the fruit off the right tree, which is to say this word, this living word, you're not going to go wrong. But if you listen to traditions of men, well, my grandpa belonged to that belief for a hundred years. Well, he was pretty old, I guess, at that, wouldn't he be? But anyway, that doesn't make it true. And God bless your grandpa. But God expects you to read the road map. He expects you to be able to read signs. You know, if you're going to take a trip and you say, it says here, you take um, 4 or 30 or whatever down to 70 to 40. And when you get to 40, you turn, you kind of know how to read signs, don't you? You know, when I get down uh, to 40, I'm going to cut east or west, all right? Why? Because the road runs east or west, all right? It's that simple. But it's the same way in God's Word. You're not going to know the signs in life if you don't have them from here. Follow His plan. Because, hey, don't think that He is too um, shy to say, get out of here. Because um, that's the way He is. You... You, that's why it's important that you personally read the map of your journey, make your own mind up, and I guarantee you, if you check it out in God's Word, you're not going to go wrong, okay? Um, the, okay, next verse. Therefore, now let's go with uh, 24. Therefore, uh, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them. Not good enough just to hear, but to do them. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And of course, Christ is that rock. Is your house built upon him? I don't know. You know. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. That's the way it is with your family and your life. I know we all have troubles at times, big deal, we can work out of it. Why? We've got Christ. No sweat. Don't let him see you sweat on your first cruise, all right? You can cut it. You're can-do type people. Why? Because you're on the rock. It'll work out, and uh, he'll fix it for you. 26. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them shall be likened unto a foolish man. I'm sorry. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And you know what happens when torrents hit sand. It washes out from under you. 
And that's what your life will do to you. The walls, the walls of your life will start tumbling down. You'll be out in that wilderness and there's no path. You can't see the sun, moon, or stars. You don't know where you are. You're lost. Then get back on the road. All right? You got the map right here. Orinate, orientate yourself on the map and work your way out of it. You can because he'll help you. Verse 27, And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall there. Uh, bang. Lives can do that. But, you know, that's what Christians are about is helping each other stay in the Word, keep on the path, stay out of the ditch, and overcome. It's that simple, you know. Well, um, if somebody just slips up, let's just brand them and put them out. No way, you're not a Christian with that attitude. You're just not a Christian, okay? We help each other. We help each other in the Word. We stay solid on that rock. And we know it's His promise that we're going to be happy. We're going to find happiness. Now, uh, let's go one more place. It's almost, uh, this, I, I do not believe it to be the same incident in the book of Luke. But it, it um, could be. But uh, Luke chapter 13. Verse 23, same way, we got two roads, and this is, this is my topic. Which road do you take? Okay? It, it's your choice, always. Don't ever try to blame somebody else. Oh, Lord, if it wasn't for old Uncle Joe, I wouldn't be in this mess. No, you're the one that got yourself in the mess because you listened to somebody. Okay? You make your own mind up and choose the right path. Okay? Don't face reality, live it. That's it. Verse 23 of uh, Luke 13. Then said, one, then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, 24, strive. Now, let me, let me just say a word about this word strive in the Greek. It means contend as with an adversary. It means fight. It means don't just kind of say, well, I'm going to try. No, it means go for it. All right. With vigor, all right. When you're when you go for something, mean business, all right. Be sincere. Strive to enter in at the straight gate, narrow. Okay. For many I say unto you will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. You know, there's going to be a lot of hurt and disappointment on that day, and that that does not give me pleasure. I guarantee you. I think it's real sad that people listen to a bunch of revolving one verse Charlies. And that's all they ever get from God's Word. And I'm not judging them. Hey, if that's what they want, it's all right with me. But you study God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and you learn how to follow a subject and don't let somebody stick a bunch of stuff in that doesn't apply. You be wise enough to know the difference, okay? And I guarantee you, you won't get out in the bushes. And God will give you blessings, okay? Verse 25. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut to the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Now you see, this has to do with the apostasy that is so drawn out in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where it states very clearly, don't let my first letter to the Thessalonians, from which the rapture doctrine was propagated, don't let my first letter deceive you, some angel or any man, or some book. Our gathering back to Jesus Christ will not take place until after the son of perdition, and there's only one. The son of perdition, do you know what the word perdition in the Greek means? It means to perish. That's Satan. It sure, it sure wasn't um, poor old Judas, all right? Judas still has judgment day, 
Satan is condemned to die. Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19. But um, there it states very clearly, there's no way the true Christ is returning until after the false Messiah stands in Jerusalem claiming to be God. That creates the apostasy because they chase to him thinking in fact it is Christ. And unfortunately, that's where false teaching really upsets the apple cart. Is it sincere? Is it serious? I consider kind of losing your salvation for a while pretty serious, especially when it's people that try. But they just listen to man and his doctrine rather than getting to the tree of fruit and doing the will of God rather than man, okay? Uh, Well-meaning, means well, nice people, you know, they do something religious all the time, like taking up an offering or something before a meeting and, you know, get started. I mean, something very religious. And instead of teaching God's Word, I mean, this stuff's important, all right? And incidentally, that's why I won't ever allow it done here. We got something more important, God's Word, okay? Verse 26, Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence. We've taken communion with you, Jesus. And thou hast taught in our streets. Your word's been taught there all the time, openly. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. So it's important, ever so important. Now, let's get down where the rubber meets the road. When you listen to man instead of him, when he's good enough to send you the letter, it hurts him. It really hurts him when one of his children listens to man instead of him. He sheds tears over it. And how thrilled he is when one of you does that that is right. And that's to absorb his thoughts, his advice. So that, do you think it's going to give him pleasure to say this to his own children? Lord, I'd hate to put him in that spot where he'd have to say, I don't know you. How, how would you like to say that to one of your own kids? I, I just, I don't know you. Go away. It wouldn't be nice. And that's why it's so important. If you don't think something of yourself, think of him. Don't hurt him that way. Get into the letter he was good enough to write to you and absorb it. Okay? Absorb it. Because it's not a nice thing to put him in that position. 28. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you won't be the, they won't be the only ones doing it. He'll be shedding tears also. When you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. And you yourselves thrust out. Outsiders, not family. Sorry. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. That's the king in his dominion. 30. And behold, there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. All get paid the same. But know this, those that stood against Satan, if you don't understand this, just put it on the shelf. Those that stood against Satan at the overthrow and earned the right to be chosen before the foundations of the earth. Ephesians 1, 4. Then they were last, but they shall be first here because they are already justified as it is written in Romans chapter 8. Okay? Now, that sounds kind of scary, doesn't it? Well, it is final. And it's reality. And if a person doesn't watch their path, it should be scary when it's so easy simply to follow his road map, his path, and not get your life all messed up, okay? All messed around in turmoil. When, do you know that he's promised you peace and understanding? Turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Let's talk about that straight gate just a moment. We just finished teaching this on television. Hebrews chapter 9. 
Remember, this is talking about the tabernacle and what takes place there. How it was in the old time and how it's going to be in the new. Book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 8. The Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way unto the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Now I want to present something to you. Do you know how narrow that gate is? It's the gate into the Holy of Holies. Where do I find God? Well, you find him inside the Holy of Holies. That's where the ark was. Those things were schoolmasters to you, teaching you how to go where God is. And at that time, there was only one man once a year, only once a year, allowed in there. And only he could offer blood and beast and so forth. And then he had to give some for his own sins. I think it'll tell us here. Verse 8 which was a figure for the time then present. In other words, it was so they could see it to teach them, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, the high priest, as pertaining to the conscience. In other words, it couldn't really do it. Can, can beast blood for, cause your forgiveness to, of sins? Of course it can't. But it cost them something. Verse 10. Which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances. That means ceremonies, traditions of men. Imposed on them until the time of reformation. Till the time of Christ. But Christ being come an high priest. And I will add after the order of Melchizedek of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Why? He was the tabernacle. Destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. And Christ is that temple and the many-membered body make up that temple. You're part of it, okay? But not, uh, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Had nothing to do with it, okay? Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in what? Once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For who? You. Eternal redemption. I don't care what you've done. You sure haven't had an opportunity to commit the unpardonable sin yet. But So it's forgivable. I don't care what it is. And anytime Christians start trying to make second class citizens out of someone, you won't see it here. I will not tolerate it. I either, we either believe Christ forgives totally and completely or we're not Christian. Okay, let's, let's just be honest about it. So um, uh, that's it. And you know, you go someplace and they'll say, yeah, well, this is, there's divorcees back on the back and they ain't teaching our children. And I've known cases where they, they knew the word 10 times better than the hypocrite that was saying that. When Christ forgives, it's erased, that's it. Don't want to hear about it anymore. It's over, done with. Okay, verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify us to the purifying of flesh. And you know, you've still got people saying, oh, if we can find us one of them red heifers, you know, we'll, we got to find them heifers' ashes again. That's an insult to Christ. Verse 14, to complete our reading here. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purged your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I mean, unload it, shuck it, get rid of dead works, traditions of men, ceremonies that absolutely make void the word of God. What happened when he died on that cross? Picture the Holy of Holies. What happened? That veil the door, the gate to the Holy of Holies was what? It was rent. Not from bottom to top that man could do, but from top to bottom. It was ripped apart and it said, come on in. Just believe on me. Have faith. Enter this narrow gate. Come in. It's your home. You're welcome. 
How can you get off the beaten path, off into the wild, when you have such a wonderful Lord and Savior? When He made it so easy for you. Well, if I, 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 if I could just be sure. You, know, you got people like that. And God bless poor old Thomas. I guess he set the example for us, didn't he? A poor old doubting Thomas. What is the way and what is the path? You, I think probably half of you in here know where I'm going to take you to conclude this. St. John chapter 14. You want to find rest? You want to find the door? You want to know how to make your journey a lot better? St. John chapter 14. <clears throat> Never forget the Greek word hados. It is the way. And he is that way. He is that path. Always choose him and guess what? You're not going to go wrong. Let's listen to his advice here in chapter 14 concerning your path. 14 verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You haven't got a thing to worry about. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now this word mansions doesn't mean some big cathedral on a hill. It just won't fly, I'm sorry. It's mano, mani, rather, in the Greek, and it means resting place. What kind of resting place did Christ provide for you? You can enter it today. It's yours today if you want to find peace of mind. If you want to rest. It's the only rest you're going to get is the peace of mind totally that you find within Him. It's not some mansion, as some people... Boy, when I get back up there in my mansion and I got somebody to mow my lawn and sit back and just, well, what kind of heaven would that be? You know? Oh, well. Anyway, some people get some strange ideas. Verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. That's a, that's a lot. I don't know. Is he in your house? Is he welcome in your home? And whether I go, you know, and the way, you know. Just tell me, hey, you all know the way. Now what happens here? Here comes poor old Thomas. Maybe, maybe Thomas bit this off for us, okay? Thomas said to him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? This must have hurt him some, okay? You know, it couldn't help it, but it's done for you, okay? Verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way. Hados, hados rather. I am the way. The truth, what makes that part of the way? What is The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's why it's narrow. That's why it's straight. But he ripped her apart so that anybody, I don't care who you are, if you have the faith, come on in. Walk in. Verse 7. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Now chew on that a minute in your mind. If you've seen me, you've seen him. What did God say, name that boy? Emmanuel. What is Manuel being interpreted? God with us. If you've seen him, you've seen, if you've seen me, you've seen him. And here comes old Philip. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it suffice us. We'll, we'll just be happy. Now, I mean, you know, with a crew like this, it makes you kind of wonder, but I don't believe Philip. I think God caused him to ask that for our benefit because he knew some of us might be a little slow sometimes, okay? Nine, Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? You don't know who I am. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. 
And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? It had to disappoint him a little bit, okay? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you? I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. That's why you always pray to our Father, but you do it in Jesus' name to document your credentials that you believe on Christ so the Father can deal with you, okay? It means to the Father you've entered the straight gate. It means you've, you've come to that place. Verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. In other words, look at the miracles I have done. It wasn't me that did them, it was the Father, okay? Through me. Verse 12, Very, ver verily, verily, truly, truly translated, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. That means his disciples. Who would have ever thought, back in this time, man, I mean, they had, I marvel that he was on a little boat in a certain kind of a place where the acoustics were beautiful, and he was able to talk to several thousand people. But in a sense, that's what he's talking about here. They, they hang us with a skyhook out here in space. You know, satellites. We're on several of them now, and we own one. Uh, a translator on one, transponder. But, I mean, that we can, you can reach millions of people. Over 325 television stations that we're on now. You know, think about that. That's... That's uh, humongous. It's hard, it's hard to grasp that. Who did that? Well, he did, of course. Why? Because the Spirit gives the knowledge and the wisdom and the authority. When you get down to the business of teaching the real word and showing the real path for the real journey, he'll give you whatever you ask for as long as it's to build the road. Okay, he's not interested in your Cadillac. He's not interested in, um, I started to say a new radio for your airplane, you know. I, I used to tease my wife about that. I'd say, okay, do you know she had the nerve to ask for a new washing machine when one of my airplane radios were out? <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> Just picking on her, all right, bless her heart. But anyway, um, God will give you all the bricks you need to build, but bless your heart, you're going to do the building, okay? I mean, people say, oh, God, just help me and give me this. And you, uh -uh, forget it. Forget it. He will only help those that work for him because he doesn't pay until it's done, friend. I'm talking about your work. That's just the way he said, he said, don't worry in another place. He said, don't worry. Solomon wasn't anywhere near dressed like these beautiful flowers. He said, you waste your time worrying in your life. And after you do my will, I'll add all these things you need. A lot of people forget, he said, after you do my will and my work, I will add these things. They want the things added, and when they get around to it, they'll do God's work. Well, they can just one on. Okay, Greater things than these shall you do if you'll do it in his name and be, get, just get real, real about it. It's a real world out there, and you better be a realist, or it'll gobble you up. Okay? But anything you ask for to further your help as a disciple of Almighty God, and you will work at it, He will give it to you. I promise you that, all right? I've seen it over and over and over. Okay, I'll kind of... Verse 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That the Father may be glorified... Well, if I only had... A, if I only had... A, uh, $10,000 to just kind of spend. Well, how would that glorify God? You know? Well, I have good intentions. Oh, you do? <laughs> well, you know, uh, what are you going to do with it? 
Well, I need new transportation. Well, there you go again, okay? It, you've got to be serious, all right? God, you know, the thing is, most people, I think, forget. And, hey, I, if anybody thinks I'm picking on them, you're sadly mistaken. I, I've been up against this wall several times, and I know how God operates, okay? And I think I forgot my point. <laughs> but God knows what you have need of, and he'll give it to you when you need it. And until then, don't, don't quit. Don't give up. You know, God hates a quitter. I, I don't know if he hates them, but he, he's not going to deal with a quitter. Do you? I mean, hey, if you've got an old man and he quits you about three or four times pretty soon, you're going to say, hey, I can live without this. Or, well, are you, are you teaching divorce? No, I'm just saying she's a smart woman. You know, <laughs> you know people will say, every woman must submit to her husband. Have you ever read Proverbs? Anyone that listens to a fool is a bigger fool than they are. So somewhere we have to kind of stir the water down here and get real. And be nice, be fair, all right? And love each other, okay? Um, how did I get into that? I really have no idea. Did somebody need that? I don't know. I know I sure didn't. Uh, let's see, where were we here? Okay. 16, let's try that. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. And he did, all right? But who was that comforter? That he may abide with you forever. Do you know what this word abide is? Abide is, it's mino. It means rest, to dwell in you, to have a resting place. Part of that word mansion. Even the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth? Well, isn't that strange because... Part of the way is truth. Well, if the spirit of truth is in you, the spirit will help you absorb that truth, give you wisdom and knowledge, increase your memory, just like that, okay? And uh, if you're serious, if you're sincere, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. That's what the mansion is, friend. Have you, is he in your house today? I hope so. I will not leave you com comfortless. I will come to you. Well, well, who was that comforter? I will come to you. I'm not going any deeper than that. 19. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, you shall live also. And he does live. Our father is not a father of the dead, but a father of the living. At that day, you shall know that I am in my father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath not hath my commandments, and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Well, where's the comforter? I will manifest myself to him. How many comforters do you need? And I'm not making light. Anytime that you talk about the Holy Spirit, you have two present when the Spirit is there. Two more verses, you'll have it. 22, three more verses. 22, Judah saith unto him, not Iscariot. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? That means make no one manifest. Okay, 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. Do you, do you want to know how you love the Father? Do you, how you can tell? You've got to keep his word. If you love him, you will keep it. There's no, no ifs, ands, or maybes. And... Listen carefully. And we, that's plural, and we will come unto him and make our abode, mano, mani, residence, mansion, resting place with him. He that loveth me, he that loveth me not keeping, me not keeping not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things I have spoken unto you, being yet present with you. 
but the Comforter, this is what he does. Listen carefully, and we're going to complete with this. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Why do I say spirit instead of ghost? The word in the Greek is pneuma. God ain't no spook, all right? And I, I refuse to use the word ghost. I, it's, it's a poor translation by man. And the Greek, you know what pneuma is in the Greek? You put it in your tire. That's why they're called pneumatic tires, okay? Well, there's nothing ghosty about that. So anyway, different subject, different time. But the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. What, what did he mean exactly when he said bring to your remembrance? Have you ever been to a place or read a scripture and click? It just kind of clicks in and like, I've been here before. I've covered this before. It was kind of there. In these flesh bodies, we can't utilize our total recall. But the Holy Spirit can certainly help us. Okay. Isn't it amazing that we were with the Father and He gave your soul unto the womb? And you were born to woman innocent, not remembering. Then to pick the way, the journey. That was so he could trust you. He only wants those that will love him. And he can't force love. If you force love, what is it? It's fake. Well, how about if we buy it? Well, they got a name for that too. Okay. Um, well, um, how about if we just demand it? Well, that's fake too. Love must generate within each entity. God cannot force that. He won't. Otherwise, you'd be, I love you, God. Love you, God. Love you. He, he might as well have a rubber woman, okay? <laughs> or, well, or whatever, okay? Do you understand? That'd be a zoi, okay? And that's a Greek word meaning uh, the, one of the people that can't sin. Anyway, he wants you to love him. That's what I'm trying to say, okay? And you're the only one that can do it. Do you understand that? You're the only one that can, can cause your person to love him. Nobody can force it or buy it or anything else. It's up to you. It's your life. I, I hope it's a good one. I know, I know that it is. Maybe it helps the little things that come along that are a little bit upsetting just kind of just kind of wash away in his tears and yours and everything's fine because it is with him, it should be with you. When you take the wrong turn, get back on path. Hey, keep plowing. When it's too rough for other people to plow, it's just the way we like it. Okay, rock on, all right? That's, that's the way God's servants are. They're can-do type people. Why? He's in us, with us, and he helps us. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the tree of life. Thank you for that tree that has the knowledge, the word, Father, the living tree, which is to say Christ, the gate into the holy of holies that has made us welcome in him, through him. Though we're not deserving, Father, with grace, unmerited favor, we're forgiven. Thank you for that. In Jesus' precious name, amen.